Hey everybody, PDA Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. I wanted to do today's live introduction, which is recorded on my Shure SM35 microphone and my Zoom H6 recorder. This uh, That's what I use to record. I use it because it's road tested, proven and rugged. Hey, so today's guests are uh, from the company called Hempwave. It's a B2B company that services farmers in the in in the industry of, of growing hemp or in looking to get into that industry, whether they're switching crops or whatever else. And so from that company is Chris Quarter, who's a fellow Army guy and actually counterintelligence agent. So sort of a spy versus spy episode, although we really don't get into that stuff. But also Ryan Tregaskis, and I'm hoping I'm saying his name right. And he comes from a multi-generational family of farmers, and he is an agronomist. And so he basically makes sure that the plants grow big and healthy and strong and uh, with fewer chemicals. And so what these guys do is they take that product, like right now the weed industry is basically unregulated for the most part when you look in in mass. And they try to create industry-leading standards for uh, regulation, for quality of product, reliability, uh, how do you track bad product, all those kind of things. And so they're a really fascinating company. And I thought as we, as we again become more normal with the hemp industry providing medicine for us and whatever else it provides, uh, I, I just found this conversation to be wildly, fantastically interesting. I went to Arizona, so shout out to Dan White, who drove me around Arizona so I could get all these great shows. Let's see, who did we get in Arizona? We got the guys from Hemp Wave. We got Jay Dobbins, who's coming up. We got Don Fry, who's a legendary Hall of Fame fighter, coming up. Um, and we have the Sawman, Craig Sawman Sawyer, who's also coming up. And so this is the first of these Arizona-based shows. We got these right as everything was closing down for Corona. So I was able to get out, get four shows from the road, and now I'm chomping at the bit to get out. Hey, if you're new to the Break It Down show, this is what we do. I mean, we, we had Badass Day when we talked to uh, an, undercover, an undercover ATF agent. We talked to a Hall of Fame-level UFC fighter, and, and we talked to a SEAL who goes and hunts down child predators and, and a company that's – just totally changing the industry in terms of hemp and how we grow it. That's what we do around here. All kinds of different topics, all kinds of different things, five shows a week. And if you like what we do, subscribe. That is how you help. Subscribe. That's a really, really big thing for uh, making the show grow. Hey, listen, enough about that stuff. Let me just tell you one more thing. We have a very powerful, powerful charity charter around here. And our charity of choice for John, Scott, and I is Save the Brave. Savethebrave.org. And if you go there and you click on the Donate tab, we would much appreciate a monthly recurring donation. It can be a small amount of money. Would you buy a veteran lunch? Would you buy Pete lunch? Okay, don't buy me lunch. Put a couple bucks in the coffers for Save the Brave, and you'll be doing a lot of help. We'll do the rest. We'll get these guys up and healthy and feeling better and uh, and back to be part of society. All right, enough about all that stuff. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for listening. Please, please, please stay healthy. And now, here comes Ryan and Chris. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, I'm Ryan Tregaskis, and this is The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, this is really interesting. We're in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we're going to be talking about the hemp industry. We've had my cousin on in the past and a bunch of other people talking about the industry. As I drove out here, fellas, on, on 10, there were, uh, I don't know, every sign, every other sign was for some kind of dispensary or some kind of hemp-based, weed-based product. This marketplace is exploding. More and more states are coming online with at least medical, if not recreational. You guys are in the right place at the right time. Tell me a little bit about Hemp Wave and what you all are trying to accomplish. So Hemp Wave is, is more about the hemp in the CBD market. And we, we handle everything from seed and multi-generational seed tracking all the way into, into consumption. Mm. So we help the farmers with their individual crops, their grows by choosing genetics. We partner them with, with labs that are GMP certified and have all the certifications for, for food grade material. And then we also find manufacturers and being able to partner them all the way through and tracing the genetics and tracing how everything's grown and tracing what chemicals are being used all the way into consumption for the consumer. That's Chris talking. What do you do, Ryan, for the company then? So I was brought on as an agronomist for the company, which I say what? An agronomist. Okay. 
<laughs> so according to Chris, I grow really big plants. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> and, you uh, make plants grow that big. That make plants uh -huh. grow big. So what I was brought on to do was provide support for our farmers that we work with. Right. Okay. Just being a new industry that the, not a lot of farmers have experience with, this mm -hmm. is a, a difficult crop to grow in certain conditions. So mm. I have the experience behind me. The real world, world experience of farming, mm -hmm. multi-generational agriculture, diversity in crops, where I can implement different growing practices in multi-areas and right. bring that into okay. the crop. So you guys are a B2B company, then you're, you're marketing to farmers who are going to supply the supply chain all the way to the market. Correct. I got you. Correct. Who's your competition in this? Are there even a lot of, I mean, dispensaries are everywhere, but what about like these companies that are helping the farmer? Well, we don't even really compete with, we don't see dispensaries as competition. It's, it's two different markets. But what about on the supporting the farmer side, like transitioning into this crop? There are some companies that do provide some support, but it seems to be very few and far between. Okay. We ran into a couple companies that, that are kind of competitors. And I hate using the word competition because it's, it's, it's more about, we're in for this for the greater good. Yeah, fellows or, in the space. Correct. Okay. And, and helping the farmers and being able to do things just so that they would be able to be successful. Got you. So many people have messed this up in the past by either wrong information or thinking that this can be grown right. like a traditional crop okay. that they've, they've really messed it up. And, and, and especially in Arizona, you can see the numbers. I think, what did we have? 40 to 50% crop failure in 2019. Yes. What's the number? It was like 40 to 50% of crop failure. The, wow. the people that actually got into the space and went to go grow hemp, uh -huh. most of it failed. And then about half of it failed on the farming side. How, what's a normal number for, I mean, there, there is some amount greater than zero of farm crop failures. I'm assuming, right? There is a, the number we shoot for is zero, right? right. We want yeah, everybody yeah. to be a success on that. You I know, mean, in general, across farming industry though. Oh yeah. Really? The, the number is pretty close to zero, but okay. the, the reason it's taken out is more by what we call acts of God. So okay. hail storms, weather, floods, more yeah. like that, not, or not negligence freeze, or anything that like kind that. Of thing. That's right. correct. Okay. So why does hemp fail more often, or is that not even what happens? I don't understand. So what happened here in Arizona is that uh, our licenses became available at the 1st of June, 2019. Mm -hmm. Hemp is very susceptible to salt and heat. Well, here okay. in Arizona, our temperatures in the sun are 140 degrees, yeah. 115 degrees in the shade. and You're standing out there all day, you're going to wilt down too. So yeah. the plants were hanging on for dear life. Genetics were an issue. Okay. So with the seed supply coming into last year with the farm bill being freshly introduced, we did not have a lot of quality genetics that were being imported into the state. So yeah. the selection was very small with that. And then, so do you guys work on the genetic end of this thing too to create a better seed? Or are you in the marketplace for a seed to find the right kind? Of, what do you, how does that work? We, a little bit of both. So we do have a greenhouse and we do have greenhouse staff that are that are able to produce a better genetic so we're always on the lookout for a better genetic and how it's going to grow better in each individual region right so whether it be california down in imperial valley great growing conditions can pretty much grow anything where it's gonna be a little bit harsher conditions up here it's gonna be totally different in colorado totally different in oregon totally different right. in washington and then totally different down south and, and back east. and is all this mapped like, do we know, like, we need this? Or are we still mapping all of this? Stuff? We're still mapping that to figure out what genetics, because with Colorado and the Pacific Northwest being able to grow, they have a little bit of a head start on us, mm -hmm. but the genetics were made really custom tailored to grow in those areas. Right. So now we're having to breed in salt tolerance, heat tolerance into our new genetics coming through. How long does that take? Multi-generational. So yeah. that, that can take up to five years. It wow. can be less. It depends what the goal is. Right. I mean, when you bring this product to market and you go to the, we talked about the Tiller, you know, farmer convention, how receptive are farmers to this? And then the second part of this question is, is do they think that they just, because they're farmers, you know, I know how to grow anything. I can make anything work. How true is that? So to answer your first question, the reception is there. There, there is interest. There's a lot of speculation. Farmers are naturally conservative. You know, we're dealing with the taking food off. So when of you say table. speculation, you don't mean they're speculative on the crop, but they're like they're skeptical of the crop. It or? Is skeptical. Yeah, excuse me. Skeptical, no, no. I just yeah. want to make sure because there there is yeah there's speculation, but where? So the speculation of the farmer, like uh, I, you know, should I be doing this? Okay. Th yes, that's exactly right. And so not the legalities of it. It's just more about the market of it. Right. Should I put my business like should I invest Correct. my my crop this year into okay. Right. So, sorry, I interrupted you on that. So, you were talking about their level of interest in this. And you said there, there is 
It's mixed. It is mixed. Okay. Yes. So with uh, the more acceptance of the final end products being CBD, CBG, whatever it may be, they're hearing more of it. A mm-hmm. lot of them use it themselves or have family family members that do. Right. So they see what the, the, the end product actually does work. It's not snake oil. And so that creates interest in let's produce this. This right. is good for us. This is good for everybody. Let's mm-hmm. help out our, into our own industry too. Give us a new commodity that's actually worth something. Right. Let's jump in and grow it. We're seeing where the younger generations are more apt to, to be receptive to this. Okay. So you have more progressive type farmers that they can have the ability to farm it yeah. and are more open to it. How's the marketplace? Like, I mean, it, it's expanding and our states, like Montana's kind of gone forward, come back, gone forward, come back, like kind of fits and starts. How is the marketplace in general, do you think? The marketplace is in a correction mode right now. Mm-hmm. Um, this time last year, the market was very high. And so we're looking at three, four dollars a point per pound. Point of of CBD uh-huh. would be, you know, if it's ten percent at four dollars, right? You know, type of thing, and then times the number of pounds, where the the price per point per pound was four dollars, but now we're looking at it and it's thirty cents. Wow! So the the market on the farming side is is very hard for biomass, and that's the raw product coming out of the field. Um, and it seems to be where farmers are still sitting on biomass and they don't want to grow more material this year because they don't know if they're able to sell it. Right. Um, and then the same thing with labs. Labs and processors are still sitting on material because they bought material last year at, at higher prices. And so a lot of them are still sitting on material that they can't get rid of to manufacturing. Right. And so it seems like these two parts are locked up. But it's very weird because on the, manu- on the manufacturing side, on the consumer side, these pl- the, the prices aren't being reflected on the consumer side. I just paid $50 for uh, a couple of um, gummy worms. Okay. And they were, they were higher, higher percentage CBD gummy worms, but I paid $50 for not very many of them. Yeah. So the prices, the prices are still staying high on the consumer side. So there's, it's, it's kind of locked up somewhere. What's going on with the, with the market chain then? What... What's causing that, Ryan? So we have some choke points that have been established really before we got in at the beginning of last year that are still now. Right. And so a lot of it is on processing distribution side of getting it to the processors. Mm-hmm. So we had this influx with the farm bill passing in December 2018, influx of new farmers, oversupply. There's a lot of speculation of new money coming into it and investors of everybody wanted to get into processing, the labs. Right. That's, that's where a lot of the money was to be made. There was equipment shortages of new equipment coming in. There were people that just decided to pull out, investor money that pulled out. So right. we still have the major choke point as the, the labs are concerned. So that's, that's hanging up a lot of this on the wholesale side, on our side. So the market is not mature enough to withstand some of these surges and regressions, I'm assuming. And like we talked about alfalfa earlier, like everybody knows how alfalfa works and there's variations, but it's not as extreme as this newer crop. I mean... We had Megan Conar on. I don't know if you guys have ever seen her work, but she tracks water and food as a PhD level moving across the nation. And, you know, the Central Valley and the Coastal Valley in California and off into Arizona, like everything is grown here. Like it's just a massive place that consumes and pushes crops out. Right. Is that going to be the same thing? Like will, will marijuana crops take a lot of that over? I mean, like people are drinking less orange juice than ever. Something has to replace that crop. It depends what the market's going to bear. Yeah. You know, it's, it's still in its infancy. It's so a couple of years ago, anything to do with THC, people still frowned at, right? Yeah. And so now that it's legal with the government, you can use CBD. It does work. Well, the demand is going to continue to rise. As long as that continues to rise, we're going to supply whatever people need. So our goal is to make where we're located here, you know, with the Southwest, we want to yeah. be the hub for this. Uh, we, we grow the best cotton in the world through this area in the Southwest. The produce that's grown through here is the best in the country. So why not be him? Yeah, correct. Completely agree. And because it is legal and because it is more maturing, the research in the different cannabinoids between the CBDs, the CBGs mm-hmm. and, and the, the whole gamut of them, the more that the research is done on those, the, the more benefits that we're finding. Mm. And so they're finding their way into more and more products, okay. whether it be gummies, whether it be um, smokable CBD. I know that vape pens have gotten a, a lot of a bad rap, but it was more black market type of stuff. But being, being able to ingest the CBDs, now they're doing more research on, on CBGs, mm-hmm. and, and CBGs are, are used for a whole different gamut of things. And the more the market matures, the more use that there's going to be. Right, for them. More, more products that can be created. And then I guess the processing plants are the ones that make the jellies and the, and the 
I don't know, all of the different products? It's, it's that... more the manufacturing side that's making okay. more of those products. The, the labs and the processing side are taking the biomass and, and the raw product plant, breaking it down, and then making either distilling it a little bit better right? so that it, it is out of the plant form. And so it's, it's more of a liquid or yeah. a, like a resin, kind of like honey uh-huh. type of form. Yeah. So it's able to be ingested right. and then doing different percentages out of that. I see. I see. It's fascinating when you think about all of this. So as a podcast guy, there are a lot of CBD companies out there like, hey, <laughs> would you be an affiliate? You know, and there's so many of them. And it's like, well, you know, yeah, I'd like to get in early with someone. I actually like Floyd Landis. He's a, he's a bike racing guy. He won the Tour de France at one point, and then they took it away from him because everybody in that sport was improving themselves. But, um, you know, I, I've used this product, and I'll be damned. Like, like it rubbed that CBD stuff on my shoulder, and I'm like, it, it feels better. Like, it's crazy. And I don't know if it's the CBD or maybe they put some, like, you know, eucalyptus or something in there, but it works. Right. And I was like, well, shit, I, this is awesome. So, of course, they're going to continue to find new uses and new ways to, to put it into the marketplace. That's all exciting. Are farmers, do they care about CBD, CBG, or THC? Or like, I don't care what you do with it. I just want you to buy it. Not really. Yeah. It's, if they're making money off of it and it's good for the industry, yeah. we'll grow it. As yeah. long as it's legal to do and right. we, we can actually grow that particular crop in our area, yeah. we're all for it. Okay. Interesting. What's your, what's your biggest challenge in as a business? I mean, obviously you want to get known, but day to day when you're talking to farmers, what, what are they saying that you're like, huh, I'm not sure how to deal with that. So the challenge is it's the inexperience that comes with it. Okay. Um, and what it is as a farmer and then on the agronomy side, I like to see university back data, right? Yeah. If it, you're going to tell me to do something, tell me why. Yeah. That's what I always do. I justify everything I do to the customers. So something being federally illegal, there's not yeah. a lot of research that's been done on it. Yeah, yeah. And so it t- piggybacks off what Chris was saying. So now that those floodgates have opened, the universities are getting involved. The research is there. Right. And so we can now substantiate all the claims. And so that, that's starting to help out with that as well. And then one of the things from talking to a lot of these places, they all hype their product as like the kindest, the cushest, the whatever is. But those words don't mean anything to me. How, how is the market evolving? And, and this must be wor- part of what you guys do in dealing with like a standard of some kind. So when they're using the words like that, they, they are definitely marketing words. And it is very cannabis culture uh-huh. that they are using those marketing, the dankest, you right. know, the dankest bud type of thing. And, and it doesn't really mean anything to anybody else. The, the, the people that are actually into the CBD, the, the weightlifters, yeah. the... The, the moms. The grandma the, with arthritis is like, I don't care if it's dank. I just want my wrist to stop hurting. Exactly. Like, I, I don't really care. Yeah. So what we're doing is we are adding a lot of value into the supply chain side of this. Okay. And we are tracking it. We're, we're tracking how things are being grown, what varieties being grown for, for different terpenes and cannabinoid, cannabinoid levels. Okay. We're tracking the lighting. We're tracking where things are inside the greenhouse and how they're being watered and what nutrients they're getting. We're also starting to track these things out in the fields so that we know what pesticides, if if there's any legal pesticides to be able to put on them, what fertilizers are being put on them. And so we're able to do this um, all the way through processing. And this is why we partner with a lot of labs that actually have their certifications for uh, CGMP certifications and and what's the one, FDA certifications? No, it's uh, winning. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, I can, I, can, I can edit out. Thank no, you. I, <laughs> I forget the other certification. So they, the, a lot of the labs have their certifications, and they, they already go through these things. Yeah. So we're able to go through, and we're able to add these things and track all the way from the greenhouse, and, and, and in many times, multi-generational. If, if we're doing clones or seeds, we know mm. what plants they've came from. We know how those were grown as well. So we're able to track that all the way through from the greenhouse all the way into consumption. And add that material to to a blockchain format, so that we can track. We know what plant has has great CBD. We know if it has any issues with pesticides. We right. know if any heavy metals have been grown in there, and or, or been used on there. If if any um, toxic chemicals have have been picked up by the plant. Hemp is one of those. Hemp and and, and cannabis are one of those plants that tend to pull everything out of the ground. Uh And so you'll see a lot of arsenic. You'll see cadmium. You'll see lead, lead, mercury, mercury, all all in these things. We're able to test for those things and be able to track that and tie that to an individual crop so that those don't make it into the mainstream 
right uh, products for consumption. So is that a is that a service for a farmer then, or is, are do you, are you guys certifying that the crop that they're growing doesn't have too much whatever arsenic or copper or whatever is in it? It's currently being done on the farming side. So when uh-huh. you, when you do harvest, you do tend to test for it's called certificate of analysis. You do pull those for the THC CBD levels. Okay, but then there's an also another part you're able to do for pesticides if anything has ever has ever been used on it. Okay, you can see what the different spikes are, and you can also do it for heavy metals and toxins. So those are already currently being done, but there's really no standardized level on what's safe for consumption. Right. And by the time it makes it from the farm through processing to the manufacturer, yeah. those aren't being tracked. And that's what we're looking to solve. Like those, the gummy worms that I bought the other day, no clue. What's actually in them. What's actually in them yeah. as far as the strain, where they came from, and if, even if they're safe. Yeah, which is a little bit crazy. And I'm going to be unfair to some of my left-leaning friends. You know, they're always so like adamant about GMOs, right? right. And I, you have to know what you're eating. And then they're like, hey, let me vape that vape pen, you know, <laughs> or like I think about all the people that go to GNC. GNC is a great company. They do a great things, but you literally have no idea what's in that capsule. And you're like, look, oh, oh, you drink it and you're like, oh, I feel huge. I mean, how many players have been like, I, I just bought this stuff at GNC. It's bad. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, it's contaminated with, you know, whatever. Ryan, what, yo, what does all that stuff mean? Like as Chris talks about it, I'm like, wait, what, all of this tracking is this common in the farming industry? Like, are people like, oh, well, you know, when you grow alfalfa, you always have to account for the arsenic? It, not really. Okay. So it, when you get into the produce, anything that's edible for human consumption, mm-hmm. we do track. Certain states have different regulations from, you get into California, uh, just to Arizona, right. one state over. We have different regulations that are involved. What we're doing is self-regulating because okay. it, it's, uh, CBD is still classified as a nutraceutical. So, you know, as far as you could buy it at GNC and it's just like anything else you right. just pop in your mouth there, you have no idea what's in it. So we want to establish our own guidelines and be ahead of the curve on that. It's, it's coming. You know, yeah. the, the FDA, USDA will implement those rules eventually. Yeah. Yeah. But if we can get ahead of that and show that we are taking care, that say, hey, we care about you. We want you to know what's in your product. I, mm-hmm. I want to know what I'm having. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a user of this. And same yeah. thing as Chris. I have no idea what's in this. I have to find a brand that I trust. And right. that's all I have to go on at this yeah. point. So if we can come out and prove, no, this is what's in it. And we can track it all the way back. Here you go. It's safe. It, it, you're set. Well, this is where the blockchain comes in. Exactly. Correct. We're, we're able to verify with data that things are actually safe and right. then tie it down with using blockchain to make sure that it, it can't be altered and it is authentic. Right. So we're able to, to take that data, verify that data, and tell the consumer, yes, this is all real. This is all safe. How is this used already in the marketplace, Ryan? Like that, they must do some kind of tracking. Like we always. We almost know which plant was the one that had the poop on it when the uh, when the E. coli breaks out, you know, in the in the in the romaine lettuce crop or something. You it, know? It, exactly, and you know that. So the tracking that we have is was done by necessity. There there wasn't anybody that was ahead in the curve like we're trying to get on this right. to where we've had you know E. coli and and d- deaths that have occurred due to that. So there was a product that was invented that's actually sprayed on edibles as far as uh, apples. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a produce, I should say, not edibles, but strawberries, apples, lettuce. It's uh, odorless, tasteless, yeah. and it's, it has blockchain built into it. And so you're already eating this. You just don't know it yet. So if you do get sick, yeah. though, however, they can track that lot number back all the way to the exact field that that came out of from the grower yeah. and trace and find out what happened. Are you next to a dairy? Are you yeah. next? You know, did you have a coyote walk through your field and, and decide to use the restaurant? You know, yeah. so that that's what's going on. So it was built out of necessity on the produce side. So that's yeah. how we we're implementing the same the same idea into this. And so that's so it does exist already on on the produce side and the commodity side in modern agriculture now here in the United States. Now you get out of the United States, it's a whole other story. Yeah. So we're our food here is the safest in the world. Huh. That's not what I'm told on TV. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's blowing my mind a little bit right there. So we spray our our blockchain spray onto the crop and then does that protect I mean does that ultimately protect the farmer because if something does happen, you know, now you don't you're like your reputation isn't ruined because you're using this certified good Kush bud weed grain. Exactly. Right? Well, and what it does is it keeps from destroying the entire market, right? Uh-huh, so okay. if you remember, the there was an E. coli outbreak that it was traced back to UM, Arizona a couple yeah. years ago. Right. And it, it infected a lot of people. A few people died over it. Right. It, it, you know, it's always been here for the last 30 years that if you had a salad during the wintertime anywhere in the United States, there was a 95% chance it came from Yuma. Right. And so, but since that happened there that, that a couple of years ago, it has destroyed the market 
for huh. everybody in right. the area. Even though they know where it came from, they traced it back uh, without using blockchain at the time. Yeah. But it, it just hurt everybody. So this way, it protects not just the, the particular grower, but it can also protect the entire marketplace. So it yeah. doesn't scare everybody from stopping using this product. I never even thought about all that stuff. The other thing I was going to ask about is like, uh, so when I have some gummies or whatever, and, and I don't, I don't really use any kind of THC product really at all. I don't even think I really get high, but like I'll take it and I'll, you know, like I weigh 250 pounds even when I'm not fat. Right. So I don't know, like, it, you know, you, you must weigh over 200 pounds when you, when you take something and it's 0.05 or whatever, that fucking means nothing to me. I'm like, give me four of them. I don't, I don't know how many I need because I don't know what it really means. And I don't know how it relates to like my size and my tolerance level. I, 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 I can drink Coors Light all day long. I know exactly what's going to happen, you know? <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, and on the CBD, so you, you get labels that are on, let's we'll take Chris's gummies, for example. The, the label says 1,000 milligrams, yeah. on, right? So what does that mean? Right. And it means different things to different manufacturers. Yeah. Sometimes it's 1,000 milligrams on the entire volume of uh-huh. that, yeah. or is it 1,000 milligrams per gummy? Yeah. You, d- you don't know. It's hard, it's hard to decipher. Yeah. Chris's are 1,000 milligrams per gummy. He found I think it was, hard yeah, one. <laughs> and I had two of them, yeah. and I took a nap. Yeah. <laughs> <Is> that- <laughs> so I can translate 1,000 milligrams because, you know, we're Army guys. Like, yeah. I know what 1,000 milligram, you know, and I, if I don't need the 1,000, I don't take it because I know it tears my body up. And so I'll, try, I'll start at two, and I can dose to where I need the dose to. But, yeah, I have no clue what that is, is like in the THC or the CBD world. The market is too new for that right now. Yeah. It, and as far as a dosage what you should take for a 200 pound male, 250 right. pound male. It's just not there yet. Huh? And then reliably, like, what does it mean? Like it's worth, it's words like light. And you're like, what the fuck does light mean on this <laughs> cottage cheese? Like what is, you know, exactly. Be, you know, and people are giving this to their children too, you know, right. so there, and it, it does have its benefits by far yeah. for that. And so it's the same thing. It starts small. You yeah. can't overdose on this. Yeah, yeah, Nobody yeah. it's, you know, it doesn't matter. Right. So you start small and work up from there. Mm-hmm. And so right now that's, that's basically the only way you can gauge. And when you move product to product, you can take the same milligrams and think you're, t- and have a completely different effect just right. because you don't exactly know what's inside of there. Well, yeah. and that's one of the other things that we're, that we're looking at for the industry and being able to establish and use data to be able to track everything mm. is being able to, to establish what's being grown, how it's being grown and, and, and get the consistency in the product, yeah, consistency yeah, yeah. in the crop and consistency through the labs and consistency into consumption because right now manufacturers are buying products it could be great one time with different terpenes and, and it could be a fantastic product. I thought about that, but yeah, right. But then if they get the other, if they get the same product from another farm or from somebody else, or right. even on the same farm, they just use different methods. It's a completely different product. I know that they have, uh, you know, like well, the folks that are experts and apparently there's more than one of these kinds, like um, the wine experts are like Southern Slope, Australia, Chardonnay. There's people like that for olives, for cherries, all these things. There must be someone that's going to be doing that for for you know hemp-based products where they're like oh this is you know southern yuma and and it must be 2012 because it tastes sunny or whatever you know <laughs> is is that is that where we're going with this whole thing is really understanding what a vintage almost is or i really do think that there is especially on the smokable side you already have connoisseurs of of the cannabis side of things right and that's where the bud tenders come in right and they they do establish those different terpene levels and, mm. it, and it, it is able to be tested yeah but to actually be able to be tasted or felt or something yeah. like that i mean it, it's definitely going to take a refined palate to be able to do that but i do see it happening on the cbd side as well it may not happen on the on the on the edible side like right. if, if you're eating a gummy a gummy worm you're not gonna go oh this is from the south of france like, right that's, that's not gonna happen oh. but on the smokable side of things i could definitely see that happen right. and what we're working on you know as far as the the edible side of things is that here at hempwave we we control our genetics start to finish right? right and so working with different growers they get the same genetics and so our downstream users want to know a snicker bar is a snickers bar right whatever yeah. they buy for they want consistency and right. that's been a major issue in this and so when we can come out and work with different growers growing the same genetics even if it's in different climates and different regions we can still process through within the margin of error a similar product every time so maintaining consistency to our our end users is key with this and why why we like to work with a multiple of growers so because because there are a lot of variables in this on this process i mean you look at human problems it's impossible to solve them because there's just too many variables but a seasonal difference i guess seasonality of a product how much does that cause uh differentiation in in the quality or the type of 
product that you get then quality definitely and a lot of what it affects is the cbd content of the plant itself okay and so if, when the plant gets stressed cbd level cbd levels go down or they right. never come up initially so you you want to keep the plant happy you right know? and so yeah seasonal differences weather uh growing conditions soil types is, is going to have a it's going to affect all of that right if you're growing under the same genetics at least at least we know you know that the key of that plant where it starts is always the same so everybody's starting from the same starting line right we may end up in some different places as far as the the cbd content of right, that right. but we know we're still getting the same product out of it yeah so as it goes through processing it's still the same product coming through and, and i suppose i should say out loud as the host that um as we talk about all of these things about the um randomness of the product at the moment that's not that these things are dangerous it's more like getting a reliable quality level each time so that we're within you know a margin of error that's reasonable it's not like oh that's the strain that's the bad like none of that it's just let's understand what this is going to be each time so that we can now take this marketable item and, and reliably you know flatten the market not flatten it but uh have it be less chaotic i suppose is, am i getting this right you're completely right a lot of times the way labs are handling this now is they'll take everything and they'll take it all to isolate mm -hmm. which is they're isolating the, the, the specific cannabinoid that they're going to be using out of that, whether it be CBD, right. uh, CBGs, whatever, whatever it may be, and being able to use that in a product because it, it is able to standardize it. Right. You're, you're able to get the same product every time, but it tends to take out the other active constituents mm -hmm. inside the plants that actually make it work. You're taking out the terpenes, you're taking out everything else. So being able to to standardize growing methods you're able to use more full spectrum type of products okay so you have everything inside that plant and you're giving you're getting the different systems to be able to work with each other right versus just this one specific cannabinoid do farmers want ryan do they want to go vertical or even horizontal with these like or are they like i just want to grow it you guys do whatever the hell you want with it i mean are, are they trying to do processing on site you get a little bit of both, right? Okay. And th I think a lot of the processing that farmers are getting into is due to necessity. Yeah. Right? Just because what we talked about before is that the, the facilities didn't go in that we thought were going to. So nobody wants their, their hemp sitting out in their field and they can't even afford to cut it because they can't go get it processed. So right. they'll invest in their own equipment and process it and just get it done and, and then try to go to the open market. Yeah, he makes, a, 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 I don't know what the hell you would call it. He just squishes it all together into like a biscuit. You know, as part of what he does, and then that they send that biscuit off to a place, and then they turn it into something. But like, there is an element of processing instead of just sending. A, now, maybe they all do this. I don't know. Do or do you just chop it at the stock, put it in the back of a truck, and send it somewhere? You can do that too. Yeah, we do work with some farmers, and a lot do have the attitude of, you know what, get it out of here, get it out of my hands. I want to get paid for it right now. Yeah, and you take it, and you do what you want with it. I right. want to fool with it. And I, there's a lot to be said about that too. I'm right? sure biscuit is not the actual technical term. No, it's not. It's fine. <laughs> I didn't we really that, don't have a lot of I didn't want to call it a hash because it kind of looks like a hash, of the, but then you're yeah. calling it hash. I'm not calling yeah, it a hash. No, it could be, yeah, they pelletize. Or, yeah, or whatever. There's all right? sorts yeah. of different ways to do this. Well, so. And it depends on what, what the end product is, too. I right. mean, some things could be going for smoke, and you have to manicure it and trim it yeah. and really cut it down versus more of a biomass where right. it's just going to get processed through like an ethanol or a CO2 system, and it doesn't really matter as much, but you got to take the sticks and sticks and stems and yeah. seeds. It's like the old Snoop Dogg. Right. We know no... No seeds, no stems. Yeah. Type of, you have Dre era type of stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and you have, you know, when you get into the smokable side, you have to have people that love it. Uh, you have mm -hmm. to, there. it's bud. You have to yeah. hand trim it, you know, and sit there and uh, bag it. So they come from, a lot of them come to the THC side. They get into to this yeah. marketplace. So you, you do have the boutique type growers that are usually a little bit smaller that actually really just enjoy that huh. side of the business. Yeah. And then when you, when you look at where the business is going, I mean, because it is in the universities and there's kids that are like, how do we make the most kindest, cushest kind, red hair, Mexican, Hawaiian special <laughs> weed, you know, like the old, they're always chasing the ultimate bud. But then there's also all of the other things they're trying to do, like get more CBD yield or CBG yield. That must be going on all the time. It is. All right. That's a good question, Pete. I, <laughs> I mean, it was more. <laughs> yes, I totally agree. With you. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wish I could have added something to it, but I couldn't. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm talking about. I knew what I was talking about. Um, well, no, I mean, as, yeah. as, as it does, and, and like I said before, I mean, as this becomes more mature and it becomes, now, now that a lot of it's legal in, in different areas, yeah. we're able to do more tests. 
the universities are able to get into this a little bit more. We're able to do a lot more research and a lot more labs. And that's why we could expand the different cannabinoids and the different, the different systems within the actual plant that work together. So when a farmer comes to you guys, they're getting um, seed, are they getting feed too? Like, is there like a feed specific pairing that you want for this? Or so that that's what we do is we supply them. We work with them developing yeah. their SOPs, and right. so we take soil samples from the farm, water analysis, see what we're dealing with up front, make a genetic selection, what yeah. best suits their c current conditions and yeah, area, yeah. and then uh, at post planting, we we sample, we t run uh, what's called a petiole and tissue result, which allows us to analyze all the nutrient levels, both major and minors, throughout the yeah. plant. There's a direct correlation between your, uh, you know, nitrogen and phosphates and as your THC and CBD levels start rising, lowering. So we've developed correlations where we can track this and see, we can predict, are your THC levels going to start rising too high? You're going to be out of compliance. So we can make adjustments in their nutrient program to counteract that, to get the best yield as possible, to get the most healthy plant as possible. So we, we help them with that from start to finish. How valuable is that to a farmer? It's incredibly valuable to, to be able to know exactly what's going on in your field at all times. Yeah. You really can't put a price on. This is not a type of crop where it's, yeah, we've done this forever and this is the way we do it. So this, you know, this is the way it's going to be. Yeah. You can't do that with this crop. It's, it's changing. It evolves almost weekly. And uh -huh. So you have to watch it closely and it does take management. And there, so yeah, farmers don't want to take time to watch it that closely. They, that's what you guys are. For. That's what we're here for. There's, there's farmers that spend an easy million dollars uh -huh. between, between farming costs and seeds or, or clones or seedlings yeah. will spend a million dollars in the upfront of, of being able to put this into their field. So if you were to, to mess up and lose all of that, yeah. you just lost a million dollars. Right. Done. Yeah, I guess that brings us to the money side of this. I mean, is this funded by banks, by VCs? I mean, are farmers walking into town like, well, going to need you know, put the note up on the, on the farm to get this year's crop. I mean, I, That's how a good farmer the, impression. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I appreciate <laughs> well, that. I, had a, I said, well... <laughs> Well, um, <laughs> not actually a word. So, yeah, I mean, how does that work? When, when these farmers go out and they want to transition, what kind of money does it cost, estimated or whatever? Give us some examples. It's, I mean, you, we can run into areas where the, the total cost can run ten to $12,000 an acre. Yeah. Uh, there, in other areas, it's five to 6000 just yeah. depending where you are. But the, it's, the initial investment, especially with genetics right now, seed is so expensive. And so you, you can't go get a loan on this, or you haven't been able to up to this point. Banks yeah. are starting to open up to it a little bit. Right. But uh, with the market the way it is, they're, they're a little yeah. reluctant. So you have had a lot of VC money come in. Farmers are a little reluctant to put, you know, put up the farm, so to say, yeah, to, yeah. to risk yeah. everything and replace another crop that they know that works with right. this. And so that's where we've come in is we, we help them get into it by supplying the genetics on joint ventures with yeah. them and partnering with them throughout the growth season to where it allows that entry point for them to be substantially less to where they're coming out with so much money out of pocket up front. Right. And then the rest of the growing season is about a, a, like a typical produce crop, we'll put it okay. that way. So it's something they can actually afford and work into their system. One of the big things that we also offer that's, that's really helped the farmers out is a guaranteed buyback program. Whereas oh. if they meet our certain requirements, and they're, and they're not hard, no heavy metals, um, be you know, in, in a legal limit for THC, if they're able to meet these requirements, yeah. we guarantee to buy it back from them. Right. So that way they don't have to go out and, and sell it themselves or we're making the promise, well, if we can move it, then we'll buy it. Right. It is a promise from our company to buy their crop. Right. Okay. And then do you guys deal with like... Um any of like the secondary markets, and I, I'm making things up here, but okay, so you've pulled the bud off and, and the leaves, the stems, and the stock, you know, Snoop Dogg doesn't want them, no one else does, and you guys are like, actually, there's a guy, Jerry, in Cupertino who takes it and turns it into whatever. Like, do you guys also help them with that, like to get rid of, and is there any waste? I, I have no idea. There, there's quite a bit of waste, and we are looking at other methods and, and other things to be able to do with this material. Right. Um, whether it be cattle feed, whether it be fiber and, and, and rope and cloth is a different crop, so okay. it can't really be done for that. Mm. But there are secondary markets, and we are looking to get into those secondary so markets. So the hemp crop can be more focused on THC or cannabinoids, kind of using big words now, or it can be more of the fibrous kind that you can make clothes and rope out of. Correct. Correct. I had no idea. Wow. Okay. And are there other kinds of hemp crops that are useful, or are those like the two basic varieties? So, yeah, so it really is just fiber and your cannabinoids at this yeah. point. So, yeah, you're getting there's green building materials that are available that can be processed out of this right. uh, feed, like Chris said. Uh, we're clothing that's coming out of it, paper. So, yeah. this has been around for hundreds of years, you know, and so they, the, the, the same 
in products that were developed back then, we're using now too, but just more refined. Oh, hempcrete. Hempcrete is using that secondary, that secondary market product. Uh -huh. So they're not using the buds or anything else. After you pull that stuff off, they're able to take those fibers, mm -hmm. and the, the leaves, the stock that's not being used, and turn it into more concrete. Huh. Which is really interesting, actually, on its own, being able yeah. to, to, to pull CO2 out of the, out of the atmosphere yeah. by using that yeah, 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 because it's sequestered already. Now it goes into concrete or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. We had a guy, uh, Bob Taylor from Bob Taylor Guitars. He was talking about urban forests and how, like, you take these 100-year-old trees that are going to come down, and instead of chipping them into mulch or uh, chopping them down and turning them into firewood, he's like, why don't you make tables, guitars, and things out of them? And you're like, holy shit, yeah. And then you see the wood, and you're like, this wood's gorgeous. It's 100-year-old wood, you right, know? exactly. And so I guess there is... Uh, a really powerful green initiative with this stuff, I'm assuming, or, I mean, you're the expert on the industry. What? There is, absolutely. Uh, you know, this, so there's the organic, let's get to this, a, a, buzz, a buzzword when it okay, comes to yeah, this, yeah. okay? And so, and that goes along with the green initiative. Okay. This. All hemp is grown organically. Okay. Um, and, and that refers more to the, the pesticide and uh, the herbicide side. Okay. So now, it, as far as inputs on the fertilizer, that can vary a little bit. We do use conventional fertilizer, yeah. uh, which is made out of what's pulled out of the atmosphere and separated huh. and pelletized. So right. you're breathing it. It's just not classified as organic. Right. But uh, it's, the pesticides that we're, are approved to use are all OMRI approved, which is the organic approval for uh -huh. here in America. So we don't spray anything like, on it that's not approved, that's not conventional. Right. We have to time it right to where it's if you there's bud on the plant that we cannot use any more material like that where if you are you know getting smoke it and heat gets applied to it that can make you sick right so we stop then so we are good stewards of the green movement when it does come to this and when you say we you're including the farmers in that as well yeah, absolutely okay I and mean, then that's part of is that tracked by the blockchain like hey this is certified not sprayed on the bud after week 12 or whatever? It, it is. Yeah, okay. we, we track everything through that. A lot of it's tracked through the states as well. So when we use products like that, yeah. so I'm licensed to be able to do that with the state. I can send out material and line uh -huh. up pesticides to be sprayed on. I have to report that to the state. Yeah. I'm tracked that way. We track it as well. And then when it goes in through testing, they actually analyze the crop and see just to make sure. They yeah. double check us. Nothing is, that's huh. not approved has been sprayed on that plant. Wow. that's I'd never thought about any part of that. But you're right. Okay, so... The legal aspect of this, okay, obviously legal compliance with that, but like getting money through a bank when the federal government isn't cool with marijuana products in general, they shouldn't let the states do it, but banks and federal go together. Like, you know, it's hard to move money through a bank and not have the federal government say that's against the law and seize assets. Exactly. So how do you deal with, as a farmer, how do you deal with that? Is it VCs or well, well, being that this is federally legal now, the banks uh -huh. are starting to loosen their grip on it. Okay. It did start with the smaller private banks that uh, we, we were able to go to and establish yeah. accounts with, and right. the larger ones are coming on. So that's they, you know, Congress is passing bills through that they're just loosening. They just they're double checking basically. Right. Make, hey, we're not going to get in trouble for this, right? There's no money cross flowing from the THC side over. Right. So that that's helped us quite a bit. Initially, when this came on, it was a lot of VC money. Now yeah. this this was a, this was seen as the next gold rush. Everybody wanted it. Right. Uh, you know, everyone I talk to that hey i'm in the industry oh do you need money do you cap that's usually the first or second question that I got. <laughs> let me throw some money into this yeah and it's it is still that way too it's the buzzword is still around let's yeah. get into this they see that they see these numbers they yeah, want to yeah, get yeah. in just a little more to it than that you can't be a rapper and not have a weed product it, like, right, it, exactly. it's part it's a requirement, of the requirement i think yeah. yeah you know we we run into three four artists every week that yeah. want to start up a some some sort of product right so yeah right. So I, I completely get it yeah, it's it's crazy. Okay, so again, regulations. So who's overseeing this at the federal level? It's got to be like ag's got to be in there. The drug guys got to be in there. Who's who do you have to work with? So the Department of Agriculture is involved on a, on a state level. Right. Uh, the USDA is involved and the FDA is involved as okay. well. So we're we're doing multiple regulatory agencies. The EPA is involved a little bit as far as what chemicals can and cannot be sprayed on it. Right. Uh, and they they filter in through the USDA. Yeah. Yeah, well, ag's always there. And it's very interesting, too, because each individual state has their own Department of Ag. Mm. But then even if you look at California, California regulates by county. Okay. And so different counties have different regulations that you have to meet as well. Sometimes you can grow. Sometimes you can't grow. Yeah. I mean, I mean, look, you go through the Central Valley, you can just click off county after county as you go north or south. There's got to be 15 of them. Farms surely must cross over county boundaries. How do you deal with, with that? 
Like, I mean, I guess farmers are used to this, right? Like they know they, they are. Yeah. They, they know the laws that are in their areas, what can and can't be done. Right. And it's when this, this takes a special license to be able to grow it, even though it is approved, you do have to apply and it's tracked very closely. You have yeah. to give GPS coordinates of where your, every field is. You have to show you're able to lock up your seed, to lock up your biomass post harvest. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do that with any other crop. Right. They don't track like that. They, the, the states come out and inspect your crop when it's yeah. in the ground. They can come out anytime during the year. And then when you get ready to harvest, you have to notify the state. They come out, sample your crop, and make sure that your THC levels are within compliance. They cannot be higher of three-tenths of 1% in wow. that plant. Anything above that, wow. you cannot harvest. Yeah. Or you have to go through a remediation process before you can even take it off the farm. So they, they check that and they watch it very, So you very can close. lose a whole crop because it's too good or too bad of a, of a, a year, basically. You, you, you can, yes. And there's a direct correlation between high CBD levels and high THC levels. When uh -huh. they start rising, they start coming up together. So yeah. the longer you keep that crop in the ground, pushing it and trying to get higher CBD levels, your THC is going to start sneaking up on you too. Yeah. It also has to do with genetic and variety selection as well and, if, and stressors that are involved. So that's, <clears throat> that's something that we have to keep a very, very close eye on and, and time your harvest. To where so you guys are also not only selling seed and that, and that kind of thing, but you're also helping manage compliance then, I guess. Ah, okay. That seems like that's risky for you guys. I mean, counties and states and federal and DA and, you know. It, it is. And, and, but a lot of this stuff is, is the farmer reporting a lot of these things. So we okay. partner with the farmers to be able to work with their local governments and work with their, their reporting requirements as right. well. And how much time does that take? I mean, I picture a farmer's like, they got to go milk a cow and not go fill out forms all day. It, it doesn't really, honestly, it doesn't take much time. Okay. So once you get your licensing in and, and get everything done, if you sit down for you know, an hour or two, you'll have right. it knocked out pretty quickly. I mean, like when you're vouching for the fact that you didn't spray, you're like, July 15th, didn't spray today or whatever it is, you know, or are you logging your time like a lawyer would do and say, this is what I did today? We, yeah, definitely. We keep track on our side of what's been recommended that's done or, right. or done or has not been applied on that field. So we're, we're covering our ends of it. We expect a farmer to do the same. Yeah, yeah. There, there is amount of trust that's involved. You know, we expect that you're not going to do anything that you shouldn't be out there. Right. Because at, on the end, we're going to catch you anyway. Right. So then right. we're going to test for it and see if it's actually there or not. Yeah. If, if it pops positive, we have an issue. It's or, you know, and we have to watch your neighbors, too, because granted, mm. when when you're spraying, if you're you've got a neighbor that has a different crop and he's, yeah. he's putting on an insecticide out there that's not approved it, in the wind, it drifts over to your crop. And all of a sudden you test hot. There's really not much you can do about yeah. that. Yeah. Well, even checking for males as well, even though we do have feminized plants and feminized seed that, that's able to go into the field, it's not fully feminized. OK, um, so there, there are different things that you can do. You can do clones. You can yeah. do different clones and different things to be able to make sure that you do plant female plants. Yeah. But there, there are times where a female plant will, go, will turn male. Uh -huh. And so you have to make sure that you're, you don't have male plants in your field. Yeah. Wow. That's, that is a lot to keep track of. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> What's the standard farmer? Do they know this? I mean, obviously, a lot of this stuff is just ag, and they do know it. It's like... Are you really good at video games? You can just pick up control and play most games, you know, because you know that stuff. But this this seems like there's a lot more involved than the standard crop. It, it is. It's a lot more in depth on the regulatory side and, yeah. and knowing this crop as far as you know, culling males and keeping levels in check. That there's a lot more to it than that. So I mean, there is. I mean, a plant's a plant, right? Physiology yeah. and botany is the same. It's right. going to grow. There's tips and tricks that we have to do at different timings of fertilizers to get it to produce the way you want it to. Yeah different products that have to be put on. So jumping in this blind without any help, your chances for success are greatly go down. So that, that's where we like to come in and help these guys. We have the ability to share our knowledge with these growers right. and make them a success because this is going to be good for everyone. It's for everyone in our industry. We want to see this succeed. And so we're going to help as much as we can. That's crazy. How do you guys scale from where you're at? Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. How do you guys scale from where you're at? I mean, you've got a fairly small team, I'm assuming, right now as you try to do this. Are you branching out to multiple states are you, are you trying to get as i mean there's only so many farmers you can get in a season right i mean does you run out of time to pitch correct correct and we we do have a sales team which is which is definitely new to the industry is being able to have dedicated sales team on the farm side of this um 
more more farm success, just being yeah. able to talk with the farmers, see what they need, and provide them with what they need. Yeah. Talking to labs and 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 processors, getting what their inputs look like and what what product do they have on hand and outputs and, and manufacturing as well. Yeah. So being able to scale that way along with additional greenhouses. We have a greenhouse that's in, in southern Arizona. Right. And being able to control these genetics and, and grow these different things being able to grow more greenhouses or build more greenhouses in every state yeah. or in, in different regions of different states. So we're able to provide better product, more timely product as far as seedlings and clones. Right, right now, it's, it's very cost prohibitive to be able to ship clones from Arizona to New York State. Okay. Um, just because the amount of time that it takes and we'd have to have lights. And, and so there's a lot of stuff like that. So being able to... To, to scale that way and, and just increase the amount of greenhouses would be would definitely be our next method of scale. Gotcha. Okay. And then when you're talking about creating a New York favorable crop, um, and, and in theory, you, you start it here, you're going to create a New York environment inside of a warehouse and then develop the, the crop there and say, now I have seed. And are you guys a farm or are you guys, like, how does the government see you guys? Are you guys farmers or are you guys something else like are you a seed bank or how do they look at you guys so we have multiple licenses especially with the with the state of arizona we okay. have we have every license from seed seed processor uh or no seed seed labeler transportation license we have a processor and then we also have a grow license okay so right now we're currently utilizing more of the nursery aspect so we, we do have the big greenhouse yeah about a hundred thousand square foot greenhouse Wow. That we do grow seeding projects and, and being able to maintain our genetics there. Right. Okay. So you guys are, in effect, a farm, but you guys do something different with your product while you take the seed and push it out to the marketplace. I got you. Where would a farmer get seed if not from you guys? Nowhere. Really? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there, there are different breeders that are around, established yeah, yeah. seed companies. The people that we work with directly as distributorships for them as right. well. It's, it's just because the demand's so high, right? Yeah. And, and these, the, being a newer crop, this does take time. We, we do have our own breeding program that's coming online. We have new seed coming in all the time. Yeah. The, what sets us, sets us apart is that we have the support to come along with it. Right. right? Any farmer can go anywhere. And yeah, I'm going to go buy the seed. Okay, I see an analysis on it. Here's what I have. Well, yeah. now, now what do I do, right? Yeah. So do I go to Google and let's see what to do? I mean, I, I've read that. And I can't, not much right, that recently. Not much, not much correct on there. Yeah, we, we ran into that very recently. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, sure. So, so this, this is what we offer that does set us apart with a lot of other companies, seed companies, as well as companies who do some joint venture work with farmers, is we have support that we offer to make the farmers successful. You know, there's a company that I, I, I love, and I've worked with them quite a bit. They're called Spire, and they, they put CubeSats into space, and they do all kinds of crazy things. Like, you guys could develop your own CubeSat, and, and they'll launch it up for you and everything, and it'll track whatever, hemp growth, whatever, anything. And um, they routinely get an email with a combination of words that have never been written in the history of man because, you know, people are commoditizing space, the space in space. You know, there's a lawyer for space and there are compliance people. So all these new things, because the industry is exploding and it's so new, there's these things like we had never thought about this. Like it used to be that uh, spaceships would go up and then they would have ballast. And then someone figured out, hey, we can put CubeSats in there. So now instead of having just ballast, they can have something there and they kick it out. And so literally like a lot of times the sats go out with like the trash, you know, <laughs> it's like out there. But so the market was exploding. You guys must have something like that where because this is, Every day, like the product is improving and changing and technology is good. It must just be always something new for you guys to figure out. It, it, it certainly is always something new. And a lot of that comes through, through conversations and through our relationships. Yeah. Being able to talk with different farmers, being able to talk with different seed processors. Yeah. Different, different lab processing things and even different manufacturers. So a lot of this stuff is, is very word of mouth conversation and, and relationship based. Yeah. Yeah, and having relationships with farmers all over the United States, we can get a, a feel on what's going on, what the gauge the temperature of the the farmers and what they want to do. Yeah, uh, and the way the directions are moving for that, so we can see what supply is going to do and forecast what we're going to run to, where we need to ramp up, where we need to scale back a little bit on. So having the boots on the ground, literally all over, it really gives us an edge as well on on our end goal side. When you call on a farmer, I mean, I just got those guys must get in, inundated all the time with like. You know, it's like going to a golf expo, like everybody's got a swing for you, like, oh, two swings with our product. Next thing you know, you're shooting four, you know, <laughs> you're like, I bought everything. So if I, like, how does, how, 
I mean, how do farmers manage that? Like just everybody's coming with almonds and lemons and this product and that. It must just be exhausting for those guys to try to sort through all of this stuff and try to manage their business and farm. You guys take a lot of that off their backs. Like here's the risk level. Here are the things we offer. You're talking to universities. You guys are talking to the, the processors. I'm trying to think of all the different areas. You're managing that, but how do you stand out from that crowd of people knocking on the door? Like, do you have um, comprehensive solutions? Like my girlfriend's brother works in the ag business and he works on irrigation and he helps do like, I don't know, not drip irrigation, but something akin to that where it's like plant specific, drip irrigation, hyper efficient, that kind of thing. It just, it seems like there's so many things. I told you about the bee flow guys that I love. You know, like you knock on the door. Oh, the bee guy was just here. You're like, well, great. Now, you know, super bees. Right? Yeah, super yeah. bees. The B2B bee business. <laughs> the B2B bee business. <laughs> but that is a lot of competition for their attention. There, there, is. there is a lot of competition. And, it, and it's just about getting the information out. It's, be, okay. it's about being able to help the farmer, being able to produce material that actually, the, that, that, that people want to read and that gives them the information that they're going to need to, to, to succeed. Yeah, yeah realistic is what it comes down to and and, and having that dedicated sales force and the the, 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 uh, ooh, the dedicated marketing team yeah. to be able to push that information out interesting yeah and we we speak their language right yeah. it's you know our, we have the, the staff on the hand that we're, we're farmers we're yeah. anonymous we've been there we've been in their shoes we've opened their bills before we we know what that's like yeah and so they can they see that and know that hey we're we're not going to screw them, basically <laughs> Probably not the best. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's what you guys do. You are, you are them. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's fantastic. We're, we're, we're not investors. We're, it's, it's not a VC thing coming in. Right. You know, there was, there was a lot of promises. One of the other things that, that the 2019 market saw a lot of was a lot of promises from people who were like, oh, yeah, I guarantee to buy your crop. Or you grow this for me and I'll already have it sold. Yeah. And there's, there's, there was a lot of promises made and a lot of promises broken. Yeah. And that's what left a lot of farmers holding, holding the bag. They spent a lot of money. On being able to do this, and now they're they're left with no output. Yeah, and we talked for those we didn't really discuss the pit. Chris and I are both spies, and uh, we both have been to Afghanistan and that kind of thing. And I've dealt with the ag guys, Ryan, and they are bonkers. These Thank are you. ag smart people that come in like I know farming. Well, here's what you got to do. And then I talk to the farmers, and you know what they go there? Those motherfuckers are crazy. You know, like so um, we come in and and uh, we'll have an ag class, and they'll say, um, you know, here's how you grow pomegranates, you pomegranate farmers, and these are. These are multi-generational farmers. Same game. You, you know exactly where these people's heads are at. So I'll come back to the farmer and I'll say, what did you learn today? And the guy will do the international sign for, all right, I'm going to tell you the truth. He looks over his shoulder and he goes, they told me to put less water on my pomegranate so they would grow bigger. And I say, all right, I'll bite. How much less? And the guy takes his hands and he puts them 18 inches apart. And he's like, that much. And I'm like, what does that mean? He's like, I don't know. I kick a hole in my little dirt thing and then the water comes in, I flood it and then I patch the hole and that's how I've done. That's how we all did it, you know, mm. but our ag teams will come in and say, here's how you get more yield. And then you take your stuff to a collection center and then the guy comes down and he shops your crop and I'm like, Hey, ag guy, do you know the market chain here? And he's like, no, like, why are you fucking with it? <laughs> You guys know the market chain, though. Exactly. Like, you understand this, like all these choke points and everything. We, we do, exactly. And, and farmers are smart people. Man. Yeah. I mean, the, what we have to deal and with, they're, they're, they are. And they're, they're farmers, they're businessmen, they're family men. They, they know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. And, you know, it's that thing called country dumb. Yeah. You know, they'll put it over on you, but don't think twice. They yeah, know exactly yeah, yeah, what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And so, exactly. So, you know, we, we can't come over and bullshit these guys. Yeah. They, they know exactly. This. They'll yeah. see right through that. So, that goes back to it's, it's the trust that's involved. There's a lot of trust. It's one of the few industries where a handshake still means something. Yeah. Yeah. And we take that very seriously. Tell me where people can find out more about you guys, because there's going to be a farmer It's like, holy shit, I want to do this. I and mean, then is this something that you could do in your backyard? So you could. And it obviously depends where you live. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah how it, big it, is it, your backyard? Yeah, how big is your backyard? It yeah. definitely depends on if you, if you can grow it. As far as growing stuff in your backyard. You're going to have to apply for a license. Yeah. It's going to depend on your state, depend so on your county. So you sound like an orange tree. You're like, I have orange trees in my backyard. And it's like medical marijuana, right? You're right. not going to grow your own supply and smoke that. You're, right. you're going to need a little bit more than that. On yeah. Good. Yeah. So as, as far as, you know, being able to do the home use stuff, not really, not so much. Um, but you can find out more information on hempwave.com. Hempwave.com. Okay. And we have all sorts of information on there. We have a, a forum there, a social media presence on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, your show perfect i love it the break it down show that's right the break it down show is the source for all things cbd we are the cannabinoid uh, center right. well thanks fellas i appreciate you guys coming on oh, thanks, thanks for having us